There are a lot of students in a first-year psychology class. When I took first-year psychology at the University of Ottawa, it was one of about 1,200 students taking that same class at the same time. I could not tell you who my professor was now. I mean, it's been some years. I still have the textbook, though, uh, which has contributed greatly in but one facet of my life, and that is in increasing the weight of moving boxes over the years. The University of Toronto is considerably larger, and the first-year psych course taught by Dr. Steve Jordans has 1,800 students. It's got to be tough to get through to that many students, and even tougher to inspire them into action. Dr. Jordans has managed to do exactly that, and his students are doing some incredible things as a result. Now today we're going to talk to the professor who assigned an inspirational project, and a student who took that inspiration and ran. My name is Eric Bullman, I'm the communications person at the Canadian Psychological Association, and this is Mindful. Blankets for T.O. is an organization that tackles homelessness through advocacy, engagement, and action. They started in Toronto and have since expanded throughout Ontario to assist people experiencing homelessness in many communities. Now, thanks to an assignment in the first year psychology class, they have a new volunteer and advocate, one who has started her own podcast. We're going to meet her and the professor who inspired her on this episode of Mindful. I'm Steve Jordans. I'm a professor of psychology and also director of the Advanced Learning Technologies Lab at the University of Toronto Scarborough. My name is Anna. I'm a second year neuroscience special student doing a minor in applied statistics and political science here at the University of Toronto. Great to be here. Well, great to have you. And Zainab, I want to start with you because we like to get inside, you know, through the looking glass a little bit here in podcast land and right. talk about right. other podcasts, which is exciting. And I read mm -hmm. that you developed an interest in neuroscience through listening to a podcast. Can you, yeah. tell, can you tell us what that podcast was and, uh, and sure. how that sparked the interest in you? Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, I actually started listening to this podcast called Hubberman's Lab, uh, also by a famous uh, neuroscientist, Dr. Hubberman. And I started listening to it back in 2019 uh, when I was, uh, it actually peaked uh, right before COVID, which I found super interesting with the timing because I was like, oh, God, I have nothing to do. Let me just listen to this podcast. And I've been like a curious kid my whole life. And Dr. Huberman, very interestingly, talks about a lot of things, but also neuroscience. And it got me thinking, huh, like, I'm curious about so many things. And where does this curiosity peak from? And that's when, like, I, I was just like, oh, it's my brain. <laughs> the brain is behind all of this. It's controlling everything. It's controlling my interests and, uh, you know, other opinions that I'm so interested about. And that's how I got interested into just podcasting. And uh, I was also kind of thinking about this with... Um, my theme for whom I started a podcast for Blind Kids for Toronto, I was just like, you know, if my interest for something so crucial, like my major beef from a podcast, maybe homelessness, that is such a crucial topic, especially during COVID, which has peaked drastically, might also be peaked in someone else's mind and might create awareness, awareness, right? So that's essentially where my love for podcasting came for. And well, it turns out a podcast is also what led me to my passion, which is neuroscience and now homelessness. So, yeah. And you get this passion for neuroscience, you sign up, uh, and then Steve becomes your teacher. So, Steve. Yeah, that's where I found Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to tell me a little bit about this project that you started. Uh, it seems to have sparked a great interest in students and a great passion for advocacy for homelessness. So, tell me about the genesis of, of the project. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I tend to teach very large classes. I think Zainab's class was 1,800 students. Uh, and yet, despite that, the, the challenge I've always felt is I want to give them a really deep learning experience that's not just about, you know, remembering stuff and doing multiple choice, but instead is doing something with their skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, all that kind of stuff. And advocacy is a great tool for that uh, in general. Uh, you need all of these skills, your communication skills, your creativity, et cetera, everything to be a good advocate. So generally, I like to have a sort of capstone experience in the course where we do a crazy form of work integrated learning, um, essentially connecting the students to some real world entity and some real world issue, and then challenging them to act as sort of consultants uh, and to provide some advice to that agency about, you know, so in, in a way that could potentially help them. Uh, and so it's really giving the students a sense of 
how their learning relates to the real world and, and a good excuse to get them working together and collaborating and also a chance for them to exercise all these skills that, that I think are so critical to their future success. And in this particular case, the subject was homelessness. So Zainab, when you get the assignment, uh, does it pair you already with Blankets for Toronto? Did you go out and find that particular organization and decide that was the one you wanted to partner with? How does that work? So I actually found Blankets of Toronto right before uh, this project, but I honestly, at first, I took it up as just to have something on my resume, like some university clubs, like how every student does. But after this project, I remember I was paired with my group members, and at first it was just a project to us. But I remember because of all the resources given to us by Professor Jordans and the partner company we were working with, I remember sitting down with my team members and just going like, gosh, guys, what is this? Like, you know, th this is something really serious this is not just a project you know uh, this is something that a lot of students need to know about and that is also when uh, I realized the power I have by joining Blankets for Toronto that literally does uh, advocate for homeless communities and that's when it really hit me that I could really do something with this and it also made me realize that I was having this conversation with someone uh, a few days prior to this like what you do at university it's actually more important what you do with what what the resources you get at university like what you do beyond university with the resources you get here right and with the and like when you are at university it's really important uh, to be able to do something for the community right because then like what is the end goal for all of this so that's when i really uh, that's when i actually started working for blankets for Toronto. i was just like you know what i can really do something out of this and that is essentially when i also started the beyond the blankets podcast where we hosted uh, professor jordan's so yeah that's really when my passion for blankets for prana and homelessness hit but i was a part of it before but it really became meaningful to me through this project so thank you George, uh, professor jordan professor uh, how do you feel when zainab says that she feels it's more important uh, the things you do outside of the classroom than the things inside the classroom as someone who runs a classroom like uh, does that hurt your feelings a little hurt my feelings um <laughs> no no it brings me great pride real really great pride because that's what it's about right it, it, it's about personal development of the students and them finding a value in the learning and then using that in some way so so seeing that actually happen in the space of months you know it, it was literally we had this project last fall and then you know to see the students so energized and, and playing such an important role during such a critical time um, it is truly, truly heartening. And maybe just to give a little more context, um, the way the, the project works is I always start by finding some partner in the community. And, and this time there was a partner called uh, HouseLink. And their mission, I guess, is to help homeless people find their first form of housing and then to try to get them on their feet, connect them to jobs, those sorts of things. And so there was a guy from HouseLink called Desmond. And one of the very first things we do with these projects is I have a, a, an interview with that person. And we talk about their journey, how they got to be where they were. And Desmond's a, got a particularly interesting journey. He went from being like an investor guy who could have been making a ton of money, but the, his, his soul wasn't there. And he came to House Link and, and really found meaning in his work. So he laid all this out to the students. And then ultimately their challenge was there are a number of myths about homelessness, that homeless people are lazy, that they're all on drugs, that, you know, all, all these things we can think about. Um, and the challenge to students was if you were going to try to dispel those myths to especially people your own age, because that's all that was the group House Link really wanted to reach. What sort of public service announcements could House Link be using to challenge these myths in an effective way? at the age group where Zainab was. And so that's why it's really cool to harness the students because they know how they share information. They know effective ways to reach, you know, their fellow students much better than I do. And so I, I get to motivate them, set them loose, and then just watch where they take it. And, and it really is a, a fun thing, I think, for them. It's a really fun thing for me. Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, dispelling the myths is one of the things that I think everyone in the homeless advocate community has been trying to do for such a long time. Uh, I work here in Ottawa with homeless youth. And, you know, one of the things that I tell people every time I get a chance, right, is the people that come to our organization are almost never there because of substance use. But everybody who is there ends up using substances because they're on the street, right? They don't end up on the street because they're using. They end up using because they're on the street and it's a way to cope, right? right? And to right. try to turn that around is is 
it's a tough sell for some people and for others, it's intuitively uh, obvious, right? right. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can just tell me, maybe give me a few examples of myths and, and how psychology in particular can help to dispel some of those, uh, those myths. Yeah, we want, we want obviously this to tie into the course and, and what they learn in the course are things like how to attract attention, you know, what, what brings the brain to something and, and makes it want to know more about it. Uh, but also then once you have attention, how do you make something memorable? And, and those are the key to, uh, keys to advocacy because, you know, often once you're, you hear the advocate at the time, you're very inspired. Um, but you walk away and carry that message with you, does it become part of who you are and, and what you do? And so there's a whole lot of psychology in there. And we, we also talk about persuasion, the direct route to persuade and the indirect route. And so the, the challenge for students is, okay, you've learned all of this at a theoretical level. Now let's apply it. You know, how, how can you create a PSA that will attract attention, that will engage the mind, that will leave a memory trace, and that may even change some attitudes uh, in, in a persuasion kind of sense. And so it's a really nice applied, you know, take, take everything you've learned and apply it in a, in a context that matters, you know, and, and in a context that's in your community that you, that you will see when you walk around your community. And so it's, it's really personal to the students. Um, and, and I felt like they really connected to it in, in Zainab's year. It was really, really impressive to, to see. And I imagine that the messaging, uh, you know, and persuasive messaging can range from anything from a tweet, which is very small, to something much more long form, uh, like Zainab you're doing now with this podcast. Uh, so you've got a podcast called Beyond the Blankets. I see that you have interviewed one person, and that's Steve here. So I feel like yeah. I don't want to retread some of the same ground. I do want people to go listen to Beyond the Blankets. But yeah. what's, the, uh, what's the idea behind that podcast? Uh, how is that getting the message out? So Beyond the Blankets, the essential idea behind is getting people to know about the homeless community, which is a marginalized community, and how our current systems are kind of working against it. We also have a blog on our website, and one of the executive members did a very interesting article on how the current architecture in the city, specifically the GTA, is kind of working against the homeless population. So we have like cement bars usually, and like in uh, the benches are usually divided so people can sleep on the benches. The floors usually have uneven bumps and such so people can sleep on that. That's what we really want. To, like these are little things you don't really notice. It. Like, you know, when you look at it, you're like, oh my God, art. But you don't really notice how people can be suffering because of that. So the essential idea behind the podcast is that I know because, um, Many people are more like, you, you know, you just want to pop in your phones and kind of listen to things while doing some like while doing your chores or something like that. So maybe while doing a chore, you get to listen to some important things. So that is why uh, the podcast came into play. And yeah, uh, just the basic idea is getting this message uh, more prominent in the society about how you could potentially help homeless people. Uh, why are they in such a problem? How uh, prominent it is in the society. Like even like I remember uh, like, like Professor Jordan's just mentioned about some of the myths that played out during this project. And I remember a big myth that even I uh, was under the false impression of was that a big major like a big part of the homeless demographic is white Caucasian men. And I realized that almost like 90,000 people every year are um, below the age of 18, like homeless youth, right? And you also said you tackle a lot in homeless youth. So that was a, a big myth that I personally, like my, my group debunked. And I, fi I find that so, so important because we are also in, at least I am <laughs> in that age right now. And uh, just having that privilege, just uh, acknowledging the privilege that we have is so important. And not only acknowledging it, but realizing how we can make uh, use of that privilege to help other people, help people literally who are my age, who hold as much potential as me, some even more, you know? So just getting that message out, just fostering a sense of community, because uh, I'll be honest with you, I found a wonderful community through advocating for this cause. I met so many people in the psychology class who are so passionate about this project. I have so many people constantly messaging me ever since I started this podcast on how they can do more for this community, how they can be a part of Blankets for Toronto, how they want to maybe uh, help me write podcasting scripts, help me with research. So uh, it's just so, so great. It's on one hand, you're 
helping such an important community and finding out ways to be more involved and also maybe realizing that you yourself could start something like this. I always thought that it's impossible for a first year to maybe do something like this, like a podcast. But I realized that with the support I get from the university, And with classes like these too, like I never realized that, oh, uh, my psychology class would lead me to a podcast. It just (laughs) happened, you know? So maybe this could even be an inspiration or motivation rather for someone to uh, start something important beyond their academic goals, right? Uh, So yeah, that was (laughs) what really happened. Absolutely. And I I listened to the intro that you did uh, for the podcast with the founders of Blankets for Toronto. And it looks like they started it when they were high school students, right? So they're also right in that age group. And Mm -hmm. they've managed to expand it to several cities now. It's not just Mm -hmm. in Toronto anymore. So what's it like working in that environment with uh, people around your age who are all pulling toward a common goal? It's definitely exciting because I I remember, like I just told you, right, that I never imagined that being a first year, I could do so many things. And now uh, working with people who are literally in uh, my age group doing like amazing things and also seeing the recognition we get, uh, we have received awards from um, two very big MPs from Scarborough. We received the UFD Engagement Award. And this also led me to basically discovering the resources we also have at university and how we can make use of that because we only usually think of scholarships and awards and such but there are also so many funding opportunities that you can put to use for the community right uh but yeah besides that just getting to know like-minded people fostering connections it's so so important at university because it leads you to places you don't even know right like now i'm here with a podcast i never knew that was possible I think a big thing I also learned is the importance of teamwork because I will be honest here, I always hated group projects. So when I saw this project, I was like, oh God, here goes my grade. (laughs) And I was really focusing on more of the completion aspect of it. But I actually realized how much I enjoy listening to opinions and getting to know more things. Like a friend of mine actually was like, you know what, since you love podcasts, why don't you start more? And I was like, yeah, you're right. (laughs) If it wasn't for that person, I wouldn't have really thought of this maybe so much working in a team environment, uh, becoming a better listener, I believe, because I know I'm always about speaking, but I've also become a really good listener. So yeah, uh, these are some of the really good qualities that I've got out of this project and working with people my age. And I know there's this myth about uh, youth our age that we don't really like to listen, but I feel like working with people like that, they have been so supportive and been listening to me so well. I've also realized that that is a myth (laughs) that we might also, you know, dispel. So yeah, just, it's been a very rewarding experience, to be honest. And I'm just so excited to see how far we will be going. And also really excited to see the achievements we have uh, gotten so far. Like I know a lot of the times people think that when you start something, it's really hard to get recognition, which yes, it is. But that shouldn't only be your motivation when it's something you're passionate about. Recognition and achievement automatically comes. So that is also one great thing I realized when working with people my age. And, and frankly, I think that recognition uh, is an important goal to strive for, right? Because as soon as, yeah. especially for something like a podcast, mm-hmm. as soon as it does become recognized, then it reaches mm-hmm. a wider audience. And the message that you're delivering uh, mm-hmm. gets to more people who may be amenable to learning about that particular subject. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that's very worthwhile. Uh, Now, Steve, you were talking about uh, another organization called uh, Housing Link that you connected with at the beginning of this. That seems to be the housing first model, right? You put somebody homeless into an apartment, into a house, and once they have that stability, from there they can access other services to deal with mental health issues, to deal with addiction issues, to deal with whatever it may be. And was that one of the reasons that you chose them to get into this project uh, is this model because it really is based on a lot of psychology. Yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. And, but, but even there, I mean, one of the fascinating parts of the course is the students, when they were getting engaged in this, they said, they reached out to me at some point and said, could we speak to one of their clients, to, to somebody who had gone through the, the process? And I said, I don't know. I, I'll reach out to Desmond. And um, he, he had this client named John who had been, um, who's now in a house for a period of time. And John said, sure, I'll come to an office hours. And we had an online office hours with John 
that really, I mean, for me, it was so impactful because John was revealing things. So first of all, he was very articulate. Um, he first of all talked about his sort of story, which is a lot line with a lot that he had a, a bad divorce. He just, he, he self-professed, he did not handle it well. Um, and he went through a lot of emotional troubles and he ended up on the street at that point in time and was for a while. Um, but he would talk about things like the following, um, trying to work. And he would talk about, first of all, the people that will take advantage of the homeless that will drive around with a truck and offer them some, some money to go do some you know task that's usually not the most enjoyable task. And then whether they get the money or not, at the end of the day is a little tricky. And so you start to realize, wow, people are taking advantage of, of the homeless population as well. And he also highlighted that, by the way, if I were to get a job, I lose a whole bunch of support. And often I end up losing more support than I gain from the job. And so that there's systemic barriers that, you know, are we all want me to, I want to get a job. I want to do this stuff. But if it's going to negatively impact my financial line, you know, that shouldn't make sense. And so there were some things the students were realizing about the role that government can play. And again, the role that advocacy can play. If we thoroughly think about the situation and the barriers to, to leading the life we all want them to lead, you know, then maybe we can do something about it. And that's what really makes me proud is that, you know, this came out of an intro psych course, which most of us think of intro psych as memorizing the parts of the brain and regurgitating them on a multiple choice test to see students interacting, collaborating, working as a team, getting excited. Everything Zaneb just said is, is the things that I'm passionate about trying to see in my students, that it's not just about the content while you're in university. It's developing these skills. And, and most of those skills involve working with other people effectively. And so, yeah, and they come in hating group work. <laughs> and so <laughs> to, see that, to see that transformation in Zainab has been fantastic. And, and yeah, that's what I hope to kind of create is a bunch of young people who think I can make a difference, but I need to work with others to do it. And so I'm going to learn those skills, listening. <sighs> what a great skill. I mean, it is a core skill to working with other people. And so, yeah, to hear someone like Zainab just kind of sort of lay out everything I, I dream of hearing from a student <laughs> really, really does make me proud. And I think that, you know, this particular subject, right, homelessness is something that is, especially the advocacy space for homelessness, is something that requires so much collaboration, right? You have a group of people who can get someone into a home, but they're not the same people who can provide the supports for mental health once that person is in there. We've got street outreach teams who have to connect with somebody in the first place and get them into a drop-in, for example, so that they can then access even the housing service, like, there's so many groups working together all at the same time. Nobody's going to be part of all of them, but everyone can play a small part in, in one of them. And Zainab, is that something that you're finding now that you're working sort of more centrally with Blankets for Toronto? Are there other organizations that you're partnering with, that you're talking to? You know, your podcast series, obviously you got to find more people to be on that mm -hmm. podcast series. Are you looking to other community activists? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, just reaching out to Professor Jordan was a part of it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I also realized how uh, tedious the work process is. Like even at Blankets for Toronto, we have an internal team taking care of all the internal affairs that's going on. We have an external team taking care of all the events that go on, partnering with uh, organizations. And when we have an outreach team that actually uh, reaches out to many organizations and such, and I think an important part to realize is that just reaching out to five or 10 organizations, while it may sound like a lot, is not actually a lot. You don't actually realize how many people do not respond. Grateful to Professor Jordan who did. So yeah, it's a, it's a big part, uh, honestly. And I'm uh, shout out to my internal and external team members. You guys are doing a great job. But yeah, uh, collaboration is a big part. We actually had a really big event last December where uh, it was essentially a toad pack competition where we, uh, it was a nationwide competition that we did. We reached out to many clubs in different universities, York University, Western, Ontario Tech, you name it, we got them. And we made them collaborate on a project where it, December, holiday spirit, but also a time of harsh, harsh winters where we often really forget people who are homeless. They also deserve to enjoy the holidays as much as we do. So we really gave a task out to everyone to create like a package where we gave, we handed out tote bags to them and it was up to them to um, create a package. It could consist of anything like thermal wear, essentials, you know, hygiene products. It was really up to them, but it was really a project to kind of foster um, a community where awareness was the number one goal. 
and to also just enjoy the holiday spirit but also be aware of our community you know so that was like a big big project we did it was it was honestly really hard we were trying to target 100 plus clubs but i think we got down to 50 or 60 which is still a pretty solid number but i think we do need to realize that it is something really hard collaborating with others but it is still possible and as long as you get just one person to work they will also spread the message so honestly just keep trying and it is possible. And I remember I had so much fun in that event, just getting to know how the process works, you know, how collaboration works, how reaching out works. I actually learned the process of emailing, which is so, so important. Uh, honestly, it's helped me so much. So just simple things like emailing is so important, just the way uh, your tone is set in the message, a very crucial skill, I would say. Uh, so yeah, I'm all honestly constantly reaching out to people. I remember the founders recently, uh, they have their own podcast for some of their own personal clubs. Uh, they recently reached out to the MP and some political party members. So through these clubs and stuff, I've also realized that connections are so important, which can be used for your own passions. Like because of House Link, I contacted Desmond. I got in touch with him, trying to get a podcast with him. Desmond, if you're listening, please reply to me. <laughs> so you know, yeah, it's it's a definitely a tedious process, but when it works out, you realize how rewarding it is. So yeah, definitely getting a feel of it, and as hard as it can be, I'm also really enjoying it. So yeah, learning skills always fun. <laughs> well, that's great. You mentioned you know the cold winters, and I think a lot of the time people don't mm -hmm. notice the homeless as much during cold winters because mm -hmm. they are inside, right? They're sleeping in a yeah. parking garage or somewhere where it's as warm as it can possibly be. And so for mm -hmm. many years, uh, the organization I work with, we held an event called 24 Hours for Homelessness, where it was, you know, at one point we got up to about 40 people all sleeping outside just on the street in the middle of uh, downtown Ottawa in, uh, at the end of January. And I was in charge of picking the day for 17 years. I picked the day and in 17 years, I managed to pick the coldest day of the entire year 13 <laughs> times. 13 for 17. So it became this is running, Ottawa. This is Ottawa. Yeah. <laughs> it, it became the running joke, right? I would pick the day in June and then they would say, oh, we already know. It was like the Farmer Farmer's Almanac. That will be the coldest day of the year. <laughs> but thankfully, we've moved on from where it was a wind tunnel. But we haven't been able to do it the last couple of years because of COVID, mm -hmm. right? Things uh, mm -hmm. obviously are much different. Uh, especially in the homeless space, right? It's a population that can't get vaccinated as easily as everybody else uh, that doesn't have access right. to the same resources. So we pivoted it the last couple of years and we created something called the $24 challenge. And so what that was, we took what people get from Ontario Works uh, and we actually took one of our youth who was specifically, she was housed, she had a part-time job, you know, minimum wage, I think it was 15 mm -hmm. hours a week that plus Ontario works, you pay your rent, you pay all these things, all the supports that are available. And what do you have left over? Well, it was $24 per week for food. And so can you live on just $24 for a week for food? It's a lot harder than it actually seems. And uh, that became a pretty big social media sensation here in Ottawa. So I'm wondering if COVID really factored into this project for a lot of students. It, it has changed the dynamic in the way we talk about homelessness and the way that we address homelessness in so many ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly COVID was looming over everything uh, that we've done over the last two years. And, and I think it did, you know, we, we heard a lot about how it was disproportionately affecting different communities. And of course, the homeless is one of the most vulnerable communities that we have in our community. And so, I, I mean, I certainly think that helps students kind of see the see the the problem in a different way as as like wow you know it's it's always sounds like a difficult place to be but wow does it ever sound like a, a difficult place to be now uh and plus everybody was already feeling a little bit of their own anxiousness and and discomfort and so not that they're anywhere near the the challenge that that you feel when you're homeless but I think a lot of people felt some mental health challenges themselves, just coping with the stuff they were doing. And so then to it makes it just a little easier to imagine, you know, like, what if, what if you literally did feel safer sleeping in a bus stop than in the bedroom of your home for some reason? You know, what if your home felt like a more dangerous place than that bus stop does? Um, and you can sort of imagine the anxiety already and think, wow, you know what, especially during COVID, 
how bad does that home environment be? And, you know, should I be judging this person for their decision? Um, what, what would I do in that situation? And, and so I think that was a lot of what we were trying to do is create that, like, like I love that Zainab highlighted the, the youth, the homeless youth, to try to, uh, a lot of advocates, Erica, if, if I feel free to say this, are, are like your age <laughs> or like my yes. age. You know, a lot of the right. homeless advocates are are more older people that that see the the problem in a certain way. And, and often younger people, you know, they're trying to get their stuff together. They're trying to get their lives organized. And, you know, maybe they don't nat naturally think of the homeless situation in the same way. And that was sort of part of the goal here was to say, well, what, you know, what if we really introduce and get um, 18, 19 year olds thinking about this relatively deeply by, by like looking into these myths and saying, oh, okay, that's the myth. But when I look at the reality, it's this. And now how do you portray that reality using your creativity, your communication skills and all that kind of stuff. But in the process, of course, they're they're learning in a very deep way when you advocate for when you advocate for a community you get connected to that community and so to again to see the sort of shadow of this you know the course was over in december and yet the discussion is continuing uh, on utsc and in fact is even being amplified thanks to the work that, that zane ab and crew are doing um so yeah that was the goal and it's so nice to see it realized and, and thank you eric as well for inviting us here and helping helping amplify it even more this is really cool Cool. I'm so glad that you guys were able to do this. And I'm so glad you're doing the work that you're doing. I think this is such a cool thing going forward. And I was thinking about this. And, and I think, Steve, you hit on something important there, which is people are experiencing their own issues that maybe they haven't before over the last two years. And maybe that is makes it easier to empathize with somebody who is experiencing homelessness. Uh, but at the same time, I went into the office yesterday for the first time in two years. It was the first time in two years that I'd set my alarm, probably the first time I'd worn running shoes in two years. So our office is right in downtown Ottawa. And I realized that in two years, I haven't seen anyone experiencing homelessness. So it's not as in my face as it otherwise would be, right? I happen to work in the space, so I'm dealing with it all the time. But for others, trying to get that message out there might be a little bit more of an effort initially. And so Zainab, I'm wondering if there's a thought that you have about tackling that. Uh, when you're creating a podcast, how do you get people to listen to that podcast who may not otherwise be inclined to do so? Yeah, for sure. And I feel like that is an issue that we constantly struggle with, even as a team, even now after all the uh, recognition that we have gotten. And I feel like the best is to kind of share your own experiences, like personally for us, like even just having this uh, thing online here, it's uh, all because of COVID, right? And it's changed so much for us. And I remember us sharing our own struggles and just always like shedding light on the homeless community as part of our normal conversation. We always try relating issues we face constantly because of anxiety, because of COVID, or some sort of stress that we have had because of COVID, being unable to access some resources because of COVID. Like I remember, like even now, right now in America, we're like, we're, we're having such a big shortage for baby formula and stuff. And it's all because of COVID. We, we are always stressing on shortages the privileged are facing. But these shortages have been prevalent in the homeless community throughout. So just like stressing on the fact that we as uh, privileged people are experiencing shortages now, just imagine how the homeless community has, you know, so just being able to, um, I guess, empathize and sympathize with people and kind of relate our struggles, even though they're nowhere as close to the homeless society. But I guess that's just the sad thing about humans. You know, we need to find like a common point first to kind of... Uh, be able to stress on something so that is something uh, we as blankets for chrono do always giving relatable content uh, to our youth and i remember uh, we really gained recognition when we started doing this thing where we would go in downtown and actually interview homeless individuals and then people realize oh they had a life like us, you know, like how Professor Jordan's mentioned about John, uh, he had a really stressful divorce. And that's something a lot of people go through. I remember we interviewed someone in downtown uh, who actually fled from war in Korea and had to come to Canada, but because of systematic barriers, couldn't really, found the, uh, couldn't really find the house, couldn't really find affordable living or couldn't bear the affordable living expenses. And even right now, because of COVID, for, housing has become so expensive. Like as a student right now, I'm telling you, it's unbelievable, really. Uh, and 
I can probably speak for the uh, for all the students saying that probably more than half of us are on alone here. And it's so, so hard for us to just imagine these people out there who had a life before this situation, but because of unfortunate circumstances, circumstances ended up on the street. It's really a matter of chance that they didn't really receive the support. So just making the public aware of this, that they all had a life like us. Some of them still do, but are on, are on the brink of reaching on the streets. So just being able to relate to people like that is hard, but it's truly attainable. So maybe just giving an insider view, like how uh, my organization goes um, down into the streets of GDA, just interviewing these people, because I feel like it's really important for them to have a voice as well. So yeah, that is one way that we do it and we still struggle with it, but maybe just letting people have an insider view of things and, you know. And I think that one of the things that, and one of the myths, I, maybe it's not a myth, but one of the things that very much has surprised me in working in this mm-hmm. space in the last 15 years, mm-hmm. and this surprised me very recently, when right. uh, it was the 50th anniversary of our organization. And so I went back and interviewed every single person that I'd worked with over the past 18, 19 years with Operation Come Home. And, uh, you know, just give me some of your memories of the organization, who are some of the memorable people that you met, like what are some of the great success stories you remember? What's What absolutely amazed me was that probably 20 to 25% of them told me about their experiences as a homeless youth Mm themselves. And I had no idea that they had experienced this, that they had gone through this. They were just an employee that I worked with, uh, you know, summer student, a placement student who ended up at Operation Come Home and I interacted with them. But so many of them had had that lived experience and then went on and took, you know, degrees in sociology and psychology, Mm -hmm. uh, ended up at university and ended up in this social work space trying to uh, assist those experiencing what they wanted to experience themselves. So I think that, uh, I mean, those are the young people who connect with other young people those experiencing homelessness and also those who might want to uh, learn a little bit more about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And just like finding that common ground. I feel like that's just the way humans work. If you find something common and uh, easy to relate to, it really induces some sort of passion. I'm sure Professor Jordan's could get into the psychology behind that. Uh, I mean, that's what happened with the group project. Essentially, we found a sense of community. I really related with my group members. Well, you know, we found ourselves passionate about this. And I feel like that is the reason we really got lost motivated enough to uh, really start something for blankets for Toronto and get to this podcast, you know? Thanks so much to Zainab Azim and Dr. Steve Jordans for coming on today's episode of Mindful. The organizations they mentioned, including Blankets for TO and HouseLink, have been included in the show notes. I've also included a link to Zainab's podcast, Beyond the Blankets, and to a YouTube video Steve uploaded, which features the talk he did with Desmond from HouseLink to kick off this class and this project. Mindful is written, hosted, edited, produced, and published by me, Eric Bolman. Our theme music is Avenues by David Taylor. Thanks for tuning in and don't miss next week's episode where we will discuss something that affects us all, but has only recently been given a name. It's called Femphobia, and we're going to learn all about it here on Mindful.